Okay, uh, what we're going to do then is we're going to continue looking at capacitors and how capacitors work within an electrical circuit. As we learned before, a capacitor is a very, very, very simple component, but it is used in everyday electrical circuits. As we learned earlier on, um, a capacitor can store an electrical charge. And now we're going to look and see how it does it. Now we've got a very, very simple circuit here. On the right hand side, there's my capacitor. And as we learnt already, a capacitor effectively is made from two conductive plates which are separated by an insulator. Now that insulator could be air or it could be another form of insulator. Now depending on several things, the size of the plates, the type of insulator, which we call a dielectric, it depends on how much capacitance, how much charge the capacitor can store. But how does it store it? Well, on the left hand side, we've got a battery. And we should remember from earlier on that a battery also stores a charge. And it stores a charge by moving electrons from the positive plate, the anode, to the negative plate, the cathode. So we have a charge between the anode and the cathode, and we can measure that as a potential difference. And in this case, we've got a potential difference of 10 volts. Now, interestingly, the battery can maintain that potential difference because inside the battery there is an electrolyte. And the electrolyte produces a chemical action that moves the electrons from the positive plate, the anode, and deposits them on the negative plate, the cathode. So let's look at this circuit and let's think about what's going to happen. How does a capacitor store its charge then? Well, it stores its charge, as it says there, it has the ability to store electricity as an excess of electrons on one plate and a deficiency on the other plate. Now that is kind of like a battery. The anode, the positive plate, has a deficiency of electrons. The cathode, the negative plate, has an excess of electrons. Remember we said that is maintained by the chemical action within the battery. So we look at this simple circuit now. This switch up here is open, so therefore no current can flow in the circuit. If you remember from our basics, there has to be a closed circuit for current to flow. There is no path for the electrons to flow from the negative terminal to the positive terminal of the battery. And if I look at my capacitor, there is no charge stored in it. A capacitor will require some form of charging supply to store that charge as an excess of electrons on one plate and a deficiency on the other plate. So if we look at my capacitor now, it would be electrically neutral. The number of protons equals the number of electrons. And if we counted them up on this plate, and we counted them up on that plate, it would be electrically neutral. There is no charge on either plate. So, if I was to measure the potential difference between the two plates, it would be zero volts. There is no charge, therefore no potential difference. What happens then when we close the switch? When I close the switch, it now connects the positive terminal of the battery to this plate, the capacitor, and the negative terminal of the battery, the cathode, to that plate, the capacitor. Now, if you remember from the chapter on electrostatics, and we looked at different charges, we said a positive charge will attract a negative charge. The negative charge being the electrons. So when we close the switch, We've got this big positive potential at this plate and a negative potential on this plate in the battery. So what happens is electrons are attracted from the top plate towards the anode, the positive terminal of the battery. And what do you think will happen to this plate when electrons are removed from it? Is it electrically neutral anymore? No, because we've lost electrons. So this must become positively charged. So we'll see the diagram through. Free electrons leave this plate and then get to the anode in my battery. 
When they get to the battery, the normal chemical action within the battery will move them on to the negative plates. So where I've got negative electrons on a negatively charged connection within the battery, what's going to happen then? Well, the two negative charges are going to oppose each other, and the battery will force these free electrons back around the circuit onto the other capacitor plate. And now, we've built up an electrostatic charge on my capacitor. We have a positive plate and a negative plate. Is current going to flow in this circuit continually? Well, what's happening to this potential difference between the plates as current starts to flow? And as current starts to flow, the potential difference will rise from zero volts. As it rises from zero volts, it will get towards the 10 volt supply of the battery. When it hits 10 volts on a capacitor, there is no potential difference between the capacitor and the battery. If there's no potential difference, in an electrical circuit, then no current will flow. So this voltage will build across the capacitor until it reaches 10 volts. And when it reaches 10 volts, we've got 10 volts here, 10 volts there. So a 10 volt potential, a 10 volt potential, no potential difference, therefore no current will flow. And that's why we talk to a lot of avionics people, they will talk about a capacitor being a block to DC. It's a DC block. It will charge up to the supply of the DC voltage, and then it can't charge anymore. It is fully charged. If we open a switch, and this is the interesting thing about a capacitor, it will remain charged. Why will it remain charged? Because there's no electrical path for it to discharge its current. This opens the path and there is no other path. Now it won't maintain that charge indefinitely because nothing is perfect. So it will lose that charge over a period of time. But initially it will maintain that charge for a considerable period of time. That's why on the aircraft, certain systems like the strobe lights, they have capacitive charging units if you've operated these systems, you have to wait a minimum of typically 10 minutes before you can then go work on the system. And that primarily is to allow the capacitors to discharge. So it's charged up to 10 volts and it maintains that charge by using something called an electrostatic field. Now what is an electrostatic field? Well, an electrostatic field, if the plates and I want you to think about this. If the plates did not have a charge on it, they were electrically neutral, and we looked at the material between the plates, the dielectric. Now they are made out of atoms. Now the atoms have a positive nucleus containing the protons and the neutrons, and surrounding them are my negative electrons. If there is no charge on either plate, there will be no force of attraction or repulsion on the dielectric or the atoms contained within the dielectric. As soon as we apply a charge to the capacitor itself, one plate will become positively charged and one plate will become negatively charged. So look at my atom now. The electrons are on the outside. What is going to be the force of attraction or repulsion for this plate and that plate? Well, there's a negative charge here. So these electrons are going to be repelled by the negative charge on this plate, but attracted to the positive charge on this plate. And it results in all the electrons combining across to one side. And because there is a force of attraction on this plate, it will maintain that charge state for a reasonable amount of time. So when it's charged, the orbit of the electrons are distorted towards a positively charged plate and energy can be stored therefore in that electrical field. <coughs> so let's look at the diagram again. This time I've got my DC supply, my switch, my 
discharge capacitor, but now we've connected it to an external circuit that contains a bulb, a filament, a light. So again, what do we do? With S1 closed, what's going to happen? When we close S1, electrons will leave this plate and be attached, attracted, sorry, to the positive terminal of the battery. Chemical action will then force the electrons onto the cathode, and the cathode will repel the electrons onto the other plate of the capacitor until, again, it is fully charged. And if we remember, it will continue charging until the charge on the capacitor equals the charge on the battery. In this case, 10 volts. When it's at 10 volts, there's no potential difference, no current can flow. So again, we charge the capacitor up until it gets to 10 volts. We previously saw that when I open the switch, the capacitor would maintain its charge because of the electrostatic field. However, in this example, we're given it a path to discharge. If I move the switch to this position, there's a route for the charge on the capacitor to dissipate through the light bulb. So is the light bulb going to eliminate? Yes, it is. Is it going to eliminate continually like it would if we connected it to the battery? No, it's not. Because when the electrons move from the negatively charged plate and are deposited back on the positively charged plate, eventually they will become electrically neutral. There's no potential difference between the plates, then it cannot sustain the current flow in the electrical circuit. So you could consider a capacitor to be something like a, a one-shot battery. It has to be charged up initially, but then it will discharge. And once it's discharged, it loses its charge state until we charge it up again. So current will flow, the bulb will illuminate until the capacitor as discharged fully. Once it's discharged, current will stop and the bulb will not illuminate. To charge it up, we must connect it once again to the charging supply. A simple battery. Now let's think about this. Um, will the capacitor charge at a fixed rate? Or will it take a certain amount of time? Now hopefully some of you will realise that when it starts off at zero volts, the potential difference in the circuit has a maximum value. As soon as I start taking away these electrons from this capacitor, and if this switch would close, deposit them on this plate, then the potential difference will build up. So initially, in this capacitive circuit, the current flow is at a maximum value, whilst the voltage across the capacitor is at a minimum value. As the voltage across the capacitor rises, then the potential difference between the capacitor and the battery will reduce, and therefore the current flow will decrease. So from that, I hope you can see that it'll take a certain amount of time for the capacitor to charge. Now the time it takes can be measured using a formula. And that depends on the value of the capacitor and the value of the resistor. It does get a wee bit complicated now, but we'll run through it very, very quickly. When we're charging the capacitor, we measure it in units referred to as its time constant. Now, one time constant is sufficient to charge the capacitor to 63% of its full charge. Or, to discharge it to 36.8%, we lose 63% of its initial voltage. It will take time. And we can see in the little graph here, it first starts charging very, very quickly. But then it slows down as it gets towards its full charge state. Why is that? That's because, if we go back, the potential of the capacitor is rising. The potential difference between the capacitor and the battery is reduced. Therefore, the charging current will reduce. So it will charge very, very quickly initially, but then it will slow down. 
Now, to calculate, if we go back, to calculate the value of one time constant, and it's important that we remember this, we use the formula T, which is the time constant, equals RC, but R is a total resistive value in the circuit, and C is the capacitive value in the circuit. So we can work out the value of one time constant by using that formula. But remember, one time constant dictates that it is 63.2% of its full charge. So if we connected it to a 10 volt supply, 63.2% would be 6.32 volts. And it will take a little bit longer to fully charge it. Now, to determine when it will be fully charged, can be a bit woolly, but it's generally regarded that it will be fully charged after five time constants. So we can work out what the time constant is based on the capacitive value in the circuit, the resistive value of the circuit, to work out the time to get it to 63.2% of its charge. Then, to work out how long it would be to fully charge it, you just multiply that time constant by five. And it takes longer because the potential difference in the circuit is reduced as the battery and the capacitor potential differences become closer together. And class it has been fully charged after five time constants. Uh, the reverse is also true if we were discharging. It can be considered fully discharged after five time constants. And remember to discharge it we must connect it to an external circuit. And therefore, maximum current will flow initially, so we lose more of the charge initially, and then that will ease off as the capacitor discharges. So initially, it loses 63.2% of its initial charge, so it's only left with 36.8%, and it becomes fully discharged after five times. And that is the basic principle of how a capacitor works. Uh, for the next part of the lesson, we'll go on to look at how connecting capacitors in series and parallel affect the overall capacitance in the circuit. Thank you very much.